Good morning and welcome. I tell you, one of the only things, bad things about two services is that we don't have 400 people in this room to sing that song. It sure is uh, exciting we do that. But uh, so gr- so grateful that you have made it out on this very rainy and nasty Memorial Day weekend. I got to tell you, I already gave the gold star to the early service. So I'm sorry, but uh, they they really did get that for getting up early on this rainy, gross Memorial Day Sunday. They were here by 8.30, so y'all were still sleeping. So we gave them we gave them the gold star, but we are so thankful that you have made it out to be with us this morning as we gather together for worship. If you're a guest with us, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it means a lot to us. I'd appreciate it if you would take a moment and fill out a guest card that is in one of three places. You can tear it off on the back of your worship folder and drop it in an offering plate on the way out. You can pull one out of the pew in front of you and fill it out and drop it in the offering plate on the way out. Or you can fill it out online at malvernhill.org slash connect and then you don't have to drop it anywhere. You just click the button and everything goes forward. I'm not going to come see you today. I just want to drop you a letter in the mail this week and let you know we prayed for you. If there's anything we can do. Today, of course, is also Memorial Day weekend. And I want to remind you, most of you are aware, but Memorial Day is a remembrance of those who gave their life in service to our country. And so today, we do just want to take just a moment and just acknowledge our appreciation for those. There's probably family members here of those who have given their lives. And certainly there are family members of service members here today. And we just appreciate your service Appreciate the way that you sacrifice so the rest of us can enjoy the freedoms that we have. We thank you so much on this Memorial Day weekend. Finally, by way of announcement, Vacation Bible School is upon us, as has been mentioned already by Adam. Uh, Do us a favor. If you don't have one of those little yard signs in your yard, grab one. They're at the doors and put it out. We're already ahead of schedule as it relates to our VBS sign-ups, but we want to reach as many people as we can, so help us with that. All right, having said all of that, we are in the book of Acts, chapter 19. I was supposed to say that at the very beginning, so now i got to stall for you guys to find it. Acts, chapter 19. It's in the New Testament, if you're not sure what that means. If you kind of turn to the middle and keep going. So um, can, the order would be uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. So Acts, chapter 19. We've been in Acts for quite some time. We're going to, uh, actually, our, our schedule takes us... Uh, chapter 19, verses 1 through 20. This morning, we're actually only going to read and focus on verses 11 through 20. And this is why. When we work our way through the book of Acts, there's all kind of awesome things that take place in this book. But there are some things that kind of get repetitive because we see kind of God do the same thing in a couple of different places. In Paul's ministry in Ephesus, last week we looked at the story of Apollos. And if you recall there, Apollos had the opportunity to uh, minister and to preach, but Apollos wasn't yet aware of the the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so we see that um, through the ministry of Priscilla and Aquila, Paul, or Apollos rather, is made aware of that particular baptism. As Paul comes back to Ephesus and continues his ministry in Ephesus, he encounters a group of other folks that weren't yet aware of the ministry uh, or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so um, Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, tell the story of Paul sharing about the baptism and the ministry of the Holy Spirit with a group of believers in Ephesus. So there's a lot of carryover between the story of Apollos and the story of these believers. And so rather than repeat that this morning, I just want you to know what's happening exactly where we are. So we've got in Acts chapter 19, Paul returning to Ephesus and the ministry of the gospel beginning to really take root in a powerful way in this pagan city. And so with that being said, that takes us all the way to Acts chapter 19 verse 11. And I'm asking you to stand with me in honor of God's word and we're going to read verses 11 through 20. Here now for this is the word of the Lord. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the name of Jesus, whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of Sceva, or excuse me, seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. 
And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Let's pray together. Father God, I pray that you would give us the kind of faith for which we would sacrifice. Father God, that you would give us the kind of faith for which we would give our all. Father, and for those that don't know the Lord Jesus this morning, I pray, Lord God, that today would be a day that they wrestle with that reality. Pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Do you know Jesus? In the course of human history, there's really no more important question that has or ever will be asked. Do you know Jesus? It's the most important question in the entire world for every person for all of eternity. Now, I didn't ask if you know about Jesus. That is an interesting question, but it's not nearly as important as do you know Jesus. This morning, I just want to begin with a word of warning. You can know a lot about Jesus and have no relationship with Jesus Christ at all. I'm reading a book right now about smoke jumpers from the 1940s. That tells you a little bit about the excitement that is my life. I've learned a lot about these men. I've learned a lot about the author of the book, and yet I know absolutely none of them. I know a lot about them, but I don't know them. I want to begin this sermon with a reminder that you can know a whole lot about Jesus and never know him. And today, before you leave here, if you don't know him, I want to make sure that you don't just leave with knowledge about him, but you leave with an opportunity to know him. With that in mind, this morning we come to Acts chapter 19. And in this passage of scripture, we encounter these seven sons of Sceva, these itinerant exorcists who are doing their effort at doing exorcism. I don't want to call it ministry, because ministry and exorcism are not exactly the same thing, right? They are attempting to go around and just cast evil spirits out of people, cast demons out. Um, But they're doing it, attempting to do it, I should say, in the name of Jesus. The problem is they don't know Jesus Christ. Now, why in the world would they be interested in doing that? Because in Ephesus, the gospel is taking root in miraculous ways. So I'm going to tell you, when God shows up and begins to make an impact in a city, there's very little doubt about what's happening or who's behind it. It's not as though these itinerant exorcists, Jewish exorcists, suddenly wondered what was going on. When God showed up, they knew who was at fault. Who was to blame? They knew that Jesus Christ was behind everything that was happening. And as a result, they wanted to hitch their wagon to everything that was happening in the name of Jesus Christ. But, of course, uh, the, the wild thing is that it goes terribly wrong for them. Absolutely, horribly, terribly wrong. This morning, as you wrestle with that question of how it is that you can know Jesus, or really with the, the, the more basic question, do you know him at all? There are three things from this passage that I think are absolutely essential for knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we begin this morning with the reality that we must expect the miraculous. We must expect the miraculous. Now, there were all kinds of miracles happening. The Bible says in chapter 19, verse 11, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. He was doing big, wild, crazy things. Y'all, when God begins to do these kind of things, it gets a little bit intimidating. It gets a little scary. Think about how crazy it is. So powerful was the Spirit of God in that place that even handkerchiefs and aprons that Paul had touched were being used to bring about healing in people. Now, folks, there's something unique that happens. When God does miracles in the New Testament, it's always pointing people toward the gospel. We don't ever have a scenario where miracles are taking place in the New Testament in the name of Christ, and it's so that the person doing the miracle can receive glory or praise or honor. It's always pointing people back to Jesus. But just because of the, 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 um, the fact that we don't see them all the time doesn't mean that we shouldn't expect Miracles. Now look, many claim to reject miracles based on science, but miracles can't actually be rejected based on science. Now what is science? Science is, is the observation of things. That's a very generalized phrase of it, but science requires 
observation. The scientific method, you learned it in high school, right? You can make a hypothesis, you can have a theory, you can do all these things. But when it's all said and done, you're going to create a hypothesis, you're going to set up an experiment, and then you're going to observe to see if your hypothesis is accurate. So science requires observation of things. Observing things does not rule out the miraculous. You understand? Science doesn't rule out the miraculous. Naturalism, however, rules out the miraculous. There's a difference between science and naturalism. Naturalism is the belief that there is nothing that exists except the things that we can perceive of in this physical world. So we would be able to see and touch this or see the stars or anything like that. that. We would acknowledge the existence only of the natural things. The reason that Christianity requires a belief in miracles is because we cannot anticipate the miraculous unless we first acknowledge the existence of the divine. Do you understand? We have to acknowledge there's something that exists beyond this. And we've got to expect the miraculous. Listen, there is no Christianity without miracles. No Christianity without miracles. And this is why. Because we have to have the first miracle of creation ex nihilo. I don't know a lot of, of, of Latin, but I got that one down pat. What's it mean? It means from nothing. God creates from absolutely nothing. He doesn't have the raw materials. He has the only raw material that God has is his own knowledge, wisdom, and absolute power to create. And from absolutely nothing, he created everything that we see and touch and know, and even things we don't even know about. We have to affirm the miraculous if we're going to be Christians. So we have to affirm that. We have to affirm God's ability to rescue and to redeem and to save. Because we see God doing that throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. What did he do? He reached into Egypt and pulled his people out. He delivered them with his strong, mighty hand with powerful miracles. We have to affirm the virgin birth. There is no Christianity without a virgin birth. We have to affirm the resurrection. And folks, I'm not saying something the Bible doesn't say. The Apostle Paul says if Jesus Christ is not resurrected from the dead, then we above all people are to be most pitied. You understand that without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. We cannot claim to be followers of Christ if we reject the possibility of the miraculous. Now listen, the the miraculous, or, or let me put it this way, miracles do not necessarily, not necessarily, let's change that, Miracles do not break the laws of nature. C.S. Lewis makes that point. If you ever want to, by the way, a side note, a really good treatment of miracles, C.S. Lewis's little book on miracles is an excellent work. But in that, C.S. Lewis makes the statement that miracles do not break the laws of nature. And this is why he says that rather than breaking the laws of nature, what miracles are doing is setting nature back into its intended created order. When God raises people from the dead, he's not breaking the laws of nature. He's breaking the curse of sin over nature, over the created world. Further, the only reason we can understand the existence of miracles is if we have some idea or understanding of the laws of this sinful natural world in which we live. Some people attribute miracles to just ignorant people that didn't know. Right? Like, oh, well, of course they believe people rose from the dead because they don't actually know how people died. Y'all, just think about that. Everybody that's ever lived knows what death is. The only reason that we think that resurrection is important is because we've never actually seen it. You understand? If these speakers started floating off the ground today, somebody would go, now that was unexpected. Did not anticipate that. And the only reason you would believe that is because you know that they're actually supposed to sit on this this stage. You know that gravity holds them down. And if suddenly the laws of gravity were suspended and these speakers floated, you would go, something has stepped into this world and made a significant impact, a significant change, a significant difference. As we affirm the existence of miracles, just understand that a belief in Jesus Christ requires us to believe that God exists and that He can intervene in this world that He's created precisely because it is His world and He has the power. There's no Christianity without miracles. But not only is there no Christianity without miracles, some of you say, well, Craig, I've never seen one. I want you to know that God performs a miracle every time he saves a sinner. Every single time that he saves a sinner, God performs a miracle. He redeems and rescues a soul bound for hell, and he changes their eternal address so that they might become citizens of his kingdom. 
One of the reasons that we must affirm the miraculous if we're going to be followers of Jesus is because he has commanded us to go and make disciples of all nations. And the only hope we can have for those disciples to be made is if we actually believe that God can take a hell-bound sinner and transform them into a citizen of heaven with just a word of his mouth and the power of his blood. Some of you know that God performs a miracle when he saves a sinner because you know exactly what it was that he rescued you from. There are many of you here today who can look back and say, I know he's powerful because I know what a horrible sinner I was and I know what he's done for me. There's some of you here today, though, who are here and you need to hear these words. You've walked into these doors and you've said probably with your own mouth, there's no chance for me. God would have to work a miracle to do anything good in my life. I'm here to tell you that he can. You found a miracle working God and you've not sinned so far that he cannot or will not save you. He can work a miracle in your life. But it's not just yours. Watch this. Some of you have stopped even praying, hoping, even dreaming to think that perhaps God could do anything with that wayward child. That lost parent. That friend that will not give you the time of day about Jesus Christ. I want you to know that you don't have to stop praying. I want you to know that you don't have to give up. Because He is a God of miracles. And he can still save that one that you've almost stopped even hoping for. Folks, we must affirm the miraculous because he is a God of the miraculous. And our expectation in the miraculous is not necessarily an expectation that I'll walk outside and be able to stop the watery river and walk across on dry land. That'd be pretty cool, right? But my expectation of the miraculous is the expectation that he can do in Camden, South Carolina, what he did in Ephesus. That he could so turn this world and this community upside down that people would repent in such a loud and bold way that they would be financially sacrificing because of their commitment to Jesus. They would be taking the the items of their sin and their idolatry and throwing them into the fire because they were of such little value to them. And instead, they would be giving their heart and soul completely to the work and the ministry of Jesus Christ. What would it look like if people were throwing their idols into the fire and giving their heart to Christ? We've got to expect the miraculous. The second thing is we've got to avoid the flaw of the excluded middle. I know, that one caught you by surprise. You didn't see that one coming, did you? This is a phrase that comes from a guy named Paul Hebert. Paul Hebert was an anthropologist to India. And there in India, Paul Hebert recognized that there was this excluded middle between his modern understanding of the world and the way that these people in this developing nation, or really the majority of the world, lives Now, in the modern understanding of the world, you have religion, and religion exists sort of wherever, and and religion is, is up there maybe in your mind. It's spiritual, it's unseen, and it's sacred. And then we have the scientific or the physical Right? You've got the temporal. And that, that's the stuff that exists in this world. It's, it's physical, it's experienced, and it is secular. Right? Not necessarily sinful, but secular as opposed to sacred. Does that make sense? you understand? And these two never meet. What Hebert recognized that in the Western mindset, in most, much of, of the, the modern Western world, there was an excluded middle ground. And the excluded middle ground was a worldview understanding that the spiritual realm often interacts with the physical realm. And that these two don't stay forever separated, but instead the spirit world and the physical world often interact in such a way that we must acknowledge their existence. We can't keep them separated forever in our minds because they are not separated in Reality. Paul says we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but with principalities and spirits. Right? There is the reality that the spirit world and the physical world come into interaction. The reality of our world is both physical and spiritual, and they both interact. Now listen, even as Christians, we can fall prey to avoiding... This middle ground, let me give you a perfect example. We have religion up here and we have the physical world down here. 
Now, I can give you the real ugly way about how many of y'all don't actually pray about how you're going to conduct your business. How many of y'all don't pray about how you're going to pay your taxes? So there's that. But how about this one? How often, when's the last time that you woke up with a sore throat, thought, you know what, I think I may have strep throat today, or maybe I have the flu. I'm going to call the doctor. When's the last time that you said, you know what, I'm going to also go to the Lord in prayer. You understand? Even as believers in Jesus Christ, somehow or other we've said our doctor can heal us and I'll let my doctor handle the things to do with my physical body and I'll let Jesus or my pastor deal with the things with my spiritual life without an understanding that the things come together. They matter. Side note, you ready for this one? Our physical life actually impacts our spiritual life. This is why our physical health is a spiritual issue, and we've got to engage in it. We've got to be careful and think intentionally about how we're handling our physical body and our physical health because it impacts our spirit life. All right, we'll move on from that. But the reality of the world is both physical and spiritual they interact. But we, we, we've got to acknowledge that. But even as we acknowledge it, watch, we've got to beware of spiritual warfare, but we have to avoid extremes. Beware of spiritual warfare, but avoid extremes. Now, the demonic is real, but we can't blame the devil every time something goes bad in our life. If you got a speeding ticket on the way to church this morning, the devil didn't do that to you. Your lead foot did that to you. Do you understand? Right? The only way you could somehow blame the devil for that is if he went out and covered up the speed limit sign and you didn't know. We don't get to blame the demonic world for everything that goes south in our lives. We want to acknowledge the existence of the spirit world. But even as we engage in spiritual warfare, I'm having a hard time speaking plainly this morning, even as we engage in spiritual warfare, we've got to acknowledge that spiritual warfare takes place on three fronts. Right? you got the battle with your flesh, the battle with the world, and then the battle with the demonic. Some of y'all are ready to engage with the demonic, but you've not yet gone to war with your flesh and with the world. Let me give you a secret. You're not facing battles with the demonic if you're still surrendering to your flesh and the world every single day. The devil has no need to spend time with you because you are already distracted. You are already ineffective. My greatest spiritual foe is not Satan. Let me back up. He's absolutely my greatest spiritual foe. My most regular spiritual foe is not. It's me. It's the guy that looks in the mirror at me every single morning. My flesh compelled or draws me away from the things of the Lord so regular. I've got to go to battle with it. I've got to go to battle with it because, look, I know that I don't always desire the things of the Lord, just like Paul. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do do. A wretched man that I am, what hope do I have? Only Christ. So we've got the battle with our flesh. We've got the battle with the world. And y'all, too many of us have just surrendered to the world. You've surrendered to the world. You're not actually fighting against the impact and influence of the world. You're just welcoming the world in. And the world will never satisfy. I love cookies a lot. Aubrey made cookies last night or sometime this weekend. I don't even know when she made them. I, she made, no, it was Friday night. And I know that. This is how bad it was. I know they were made Friday night because I know I had a chocolate chip cookie for breakfast yesterday morning. That's how I know. That tells you the problem. You already picked up on it, didn't you? Those cookies were amazing. You know what they didn't do? They didn't satisfy me. How do I know? Because I was going to just get a bite of a cookie. And I think I had four or six or eight. I don't even know. It was bad, okay? It was a lot of cookies. It's not my fault. They were really good. Okay, it's all my fault, 100% my fault. You understand? But the world is that way for us. I mean, we always think, I'll just take just a little bit more. You know? If I get that $5 raise, then man, if I were to make five more dollars an hour, I would never want anything else in the world. If I got that new car, then I would never want anything else in the world until the next new model came out, right? I had a friend that said, if I ever got to $30,000 in my savings account, I think that I would just be content for the rest of my life. I said, how'd that go? He said, I hit 30 and I couldn't wait to get to 50. 
right? We, we always want more. There's always a desire because the world doesn't satisfy us. And listen, some of y'all are selling your souls to keep up with the Joneses. Some of y'all are selling your children's souls to keep up with the Joneses. My heart broke this week. I saw somebody engage in a conversation. That showed me how they had put their children up as this idol. I saw them reprimand another parent because this other parent had questions about exactly what they were going to do. Well, you know what? Everything in your life should stop so you can do this. I actually heard this woman say it. Everything else should stop so that this can happen. And if you don't want to do that, then I don't know what to tell you. And my heart broke because I saw the idol. I saw it. We've got to beware of spiritual warfare. We need to beware of the satanic and the demonic. But y'all, you need to be really wary of the way that you're bringing the world into your homes and into your children's lives and you're just selling out. Let me just ask you. I won't even yell at your preacher. Let me just ask you. Let me trust the Holy Spirit to do the work. How many of your calendars look significantly different than the calendars of your non-Christian friends? Because I am growing convinced that the devil has done nothing more or better in our culture, in our generation, than to make us so busy that we don't even have time for the Lord. I mean, I see people that are supposedly followers of Jesus who have stopped even prioritizing church attendance on their calendar if it conflicts with anything else. There was a time, and, 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 and for the record, this isn't just like Craig. These are trends across our culture right now. There was a time when regular church attendance was considered three times a month. Christians, Christians have become so irregular in their attendance because they're chasing everything else in the world that regular church attendance is now, is now defined by most demographers as one time a month. We're looking at a passage of Scripture where a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted the value of them and found it come to 50,000 pieces of silver. We're looking at believers that when they came to the Lord, they burned their idols. And the, 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 the church culture in America today is no longer burning their idols. They're baptizing their idols. The demonic is real, and some of you are so serious about protecting your children from Jesus, but, uh, excuse me, well, Freudian slip. That's where I was going, you ready? Some of you are so concerned about protecting your kids from demons, that you've forgotten that right now they need to be protected from you and your ego to get out of them what you didn't accomplish. You're so serious about protecting your children from demons, but you've not protected them from the things of the world because their social calendar, and, and, and it looks exactly like all of their non-believing friends. Beware. Avoid this flaw of the excluded middle. Avoid the idea that you can have your religious life and then your rest of your life and the two never come into to, to conflict. No, 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 no. Our spiritual life, our religious life has to impact this life. And if it doesn't, watch. If it doesn't, then you probably don't have a relationship with Jesus in this life. And even if you do, you are probably robbing your children or your grandchildren from having that relationship with Christ. Avoid the flaw of the excluded middle. Stop trying to separate your life into the secular and the religious, however you flip it around. 
Recognize that the two have to come together regularly. And then third, this morning, I want you to know Jesus personally. A familiarity with Jesus can condemn you to hell. I thought long and hard about that statement, and I stand by every word of it. James says, you believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe, and they shudder. Folks, knowing about Jesus is not the same as knowing Jesus. Knowing about Jesus is not the same thing as being transformed by Jesus so much that you would burn your magic books or whichever one of your idols you cling to most closely. A familiarity with Jesus can condemn you to hell. It was once said of Billy Graham that Billy Graham said, The hardest thing about his ministry was getting church people lost so that he could get them saved. Why? Because some of you are so familiar with Jesus, you don't even recognize that you don't know Jesus. We read a lot of books in our house. We're like that. Uh, We we read books. We do audio books. And we had a pretty funny story that happened last night. Um... I'm going to drop names. I didn't in the early service. We might as well go there. But Aubrey was looking for a book to read. And she said, hey, I'm looking for a good book. And Angela recommended a book to her. And she said, okay, uh, where is it? She said, it's upstairs somewhere. Now, we have a, a closet in our, on our second floor in our upstairs that's got lots of bookshelves in it. And it's just slammed full of books. We call it our library. She says, it's probably stuck in the library somewhere. So Aubrey says, okay. She goes up. She starts looking for the book. And she's yelling from upstairs. We're sitting downstairs. And, uh, well, what color is it? It's, it's like yellow or cream colored. What's it called again? It's, it's called this. It's, it's got this picture on the cover. Well, I don't see it. Well, look, look on that other shelf behind the books. Because there's some shelves that have double stacked books. We have a problem. Look behind there. Maybe it's back there. I don't see it. Well, check the bedside table. I looked. Maybe it got stuck in your dad's. I, I, what, what does it look like? Is it a paperback or a hardback? It's a paperback. Hold on. Let me look it up and make sure I'm telling you the right book. So she looks up. The, she's literally sitting in front of me. She pulls her phone out looks up the book on Amazon. And goes, oh, I'm sorry. It's a black cover. I was wrong. I, I, I messed you up. It's a black cover. For 10 minutes, Aubrey looks for this book. And she says, I can't find this book anywhere. And then Angela said, oh, Aubrey, I'm sorry. I just remembered I didn't even read that book. I listened to it on Audible. We don't even own it. Like, greatest wild goose chase of all time. But it gave me a perfect illustration this morning. She knew all about the book, but she didn't know the book. She knew all about it, but she never held the book in her hands. She knew enough about it to be convinced that she had an intimate relationship with it, but she had never touched it. And that's how a familiarity with Jesus can condemn us to hell. Because you can know so much about Him. Because you've been so surrounded by the things of the Lord living here in the South. Or maybe growing up with a grandma that was a Sunday school teacher. Or a daddy that was a deacon. And Jesus was all around you. But He's never been in you. I didn't say this in the first service, but we're going to go there for the second service. Y'all get extra credit. Parents and grandparents, I want you to listen very carefully to me. Giving your kids a familiarity with Jesus without a relationship with Jesus can condemn your children to hell. Now I'm going to talk to you about how you make them familiar. I have a wedding this Saturday that I'm going to try to attend for my second cousin. They live about five hours away and have for all of his life. He's 23. Good kid. Loves Jesus in law school. If I go, I'll go by myself. Now, what's funny is my kids know who he is because they've seen him at you know, a family gathering once a year, once every couple of years. But if he walked into this building today, unless I pointed him out and acknowledged him, they they wouldn't actually recognize him. But 
there's still enough familiarity. They know his name. I say, hey, there's Wesley. And they can say, oh, yeah, that's our cousin, Wesley. You see, there's plenty of familiarity with him because they've seen him a few times a year, but they don't actually know him. Remember what I said about regular church attendance being once a month? You should get your kids with one Sunday a month church. With 12 Sundays a year, 12 encounters with Jesus a year, you give them plenty of familiarity. I, I, I know this is not nice, okay? But I need you to listen. Some of you are giving your kids plenty of familiarity with Jesus. But you're not actually giving them Christ. They might recognize him from across the room. And because they've heard enough about him, they might actually think they know him. But they've never held him in their hand. Well, but they believe that God exists. Even the demons believe and they shudder. Knowing about Jesus can condemn you to hell, but knowing Jesus, knowing Jesus is a whole other thing. See, being familiar with Jesus can condemn you to hell, but becoming part of God's family will save you for all of eternity. There's a lot of people I'm familiar with but then there's family, right? There's family. My family gets all of me. So since we are a family that has, has adopted, like we get this in a different way. Like we fully get it. We understand it. We know what it's like to just wake up one day and go, boom, you're now officially, legally, 148% a part of our family. Like we can go back and look at the pictures from the day that we celebrated Adoption Day. This is when it happened on this day. These are the people that were there. This was the party that we had. And we did it because you were legally 100% ours. You're now family. You're not just somebody I met. You're not just somebody I see occasionally. No, no, no. You are a part of the family. You're all in. Nothing changes that. Nothing ever takes it away. Folks, I want you to be a part of God's family because I want you to know that in that family unit, there is safety and security for all of eternity. And this morning, that's the whole purpose for this sermon. Do you know Jesus? Not do you know about Him. Do you know him? Do you know him in such a way that you'd be willing to stop trying to baptize your idols and pretend like somehow or other chasing after the things of the world and calling it Jesus is okay and instead you'd be willing to lay those altars, those idols on the fire and watch them be burned to God's glory? Do you know him? I didn't ask you if, you if your daddy was a deacon. Do you know him? Not is your second cousin a pastor. Do you know Jesus? Not did you go up across the street from the church. Do you know him? Has he changed you? Has he saved you? This morning as we move into an invitation. That's it. There's two things. Number one, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, if you don't know him, I'd love to pray with you today. Remember what I said, though, about expecting the miraculous? If you're here and you don't think there's any way that God could save you, that it would take a miracle for God to do something with me. It's a miracle the place didn't catch on fire when I walked in the door. I got great news. He's in the miracle business. You're in the right place. But here's the second part of this invitation. If you don't know Jesus, I want to pray with you. But some of you have struggled to continue to believe that God could actually do something with that friend, that child, that mom, that sister. I want to remind you today that you should expect the miraculous. 
that you can pray for the miraculous because He is a miracle-working God. He can restore marriages. He can restore lives. He can save from addiction. This morning as we sing, if you're here today and you need one of those miracles, I would be honored to pray with you. But if you're here today and you need one of those miracles, I want to invite you to come and pray around this altar. As followers of Jesus, we have to expect the miraculous because the only hope there ever was for us was for there to be a miracle-working God who would come down to earth and be born of a virgin who would live 33 years of sinless perfection, would die on a cruel, rugged cross, and would miraculously rise again from the grave. And then somehow in His grace and His mercy and His infinite wisdom would look down at us in our sinful, wretched estate, and He would miraculously save us from our sin and set our feet on the solid rock that is salvation in Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you need Jesus, if you're here today and you just need God to work a miracle in your life, Please come today. He's that kind of God. And you might just be that kind of person in that kind of place that's ready today to experience all the miraculous outpouring of God's love in your life. Let's pray together. Father God in heaven, we thank you for loving us and thank you for Jesus Christ who died to save us from our sin. Thank you that you're a miracle working God and I pray, Lord God, that you'd work among us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with us this morning as we sing. Thank you for joining with us here online at Malvern Hill Baptist Church. We would love to get to know you better and to pray with you. If you would like to be contacted for prayer or to find out how to become a follower of Christ or maybe you just want to find out more about Malvern Hill, please fill out our connection card online at www.malvernhill.org connect. You can also go there to our website. You'll find a lot of information about our church. There's sermons, there's resources. There's other tools that can help you to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can even give to the work of ministry right there from our website. Thank you so much for being here with us. We hope that you can join us in person very soon. But until that time, I pray that God would bless you in this week as you seek to honor Him with your life. I hope to see you soon. Have a great week.